Welcome to Just Relationships, the show that offers you concrete ways to make your relationships better. Whether it's your boss, your spouse, your children, or your friends, the quality of your relationships in life directly affects how you feel about yourself and the success you achieve. Your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer, a psychotherapist, telecoach, author, and seminar leader, will interview top experts to help you learn to manage this essential part of your life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer. Greetings to you. Well, would you like to reduce some stress and anxiety without medication? Can you imagine? You know, we live in such a stressful world and very anxiety-provoking, and many people just go and pop a pill, and sometimes a doctor can say, here, just take this, rather than go to psychotherapy or go to church or meditate. And um, we are going to be looking at calming the brain today with Dr. Mark Beischel, who wrote the book, Calming the Brain Through Mindfulness and Christian Meditation. And is this, if people are not Christians, can they listen to this as well, Dr. Mark? Oh, I certainly think so, yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, so it was, written, it was written for people who just find that they're always worrying about the future or things in the past, and that can be anybody. Mm. Yes, and you, and you write about uh, the brain, how the brain works. And right. um, and we can always just look at the the higher point you're making, our higher power. Uh, look at something philosophically or generally, and find ways. You also talk about attachment, which is a very very important subject, and even right, the relationship. And, and, it, and it, it certainly is in terms of your station that base is based on. Re- fixing relationships exactly exactly because right it all starts with very early in development with making connection and feeling safe and secure about that connection right not. and in attachment theory when somehow the infant doesn't feel trusting um doesn't feel secure uh, that stays. That can stay for a lifetime. We we call that faulty attachment and other other terms. Well, I've seen so many people spend their whole lifetime wrangling, trying to make sense out of relationships. Right. And they just missed an early piece in development. Mm-hmm. And so it's way more complicated. I always thank my parents for having taken good care of me. Mm. because wow. uh, that makes life so different than oh. many of the people I've seen over the years. Yes, and as a psychotherapist, so many of my clients will look at me and be absolutely clueless. I, I don't know why I feel this way. I don't know why I'm so anxious and depressed and untrusting and afraid of intimacy. My parents were good to me. Um, You know, many people say that and they don't really have comparisons in their mind. But, uh, you you know, John John Bowlby, in his uh, third volume on attachment, Mm -hmm. addresses that. And he says, on an adult level, you don't get that security the way it's going to manifest itself on an adult level, is with anxiety and depression. Right. And I've seen so many people that should just, you know, actualize exactly what Bowlby was talking about. Right. Right. And then once you have, if you don't know you had attachment difficulty, but you do know you're you're anxious and depressed, then you can kind of, of suppose that there was some problem with the early trust and security and then what do you do right well i know you wrote your book about then what what can you do when you talk about calming the brain and you know for many years if you looked at the literature on this it wasn't people didn't have very good ideas about what to do 
Yeah. You know, and um, probably of all the things that's come down the pike in recent years, it's mindfulness and meditation. And that's what my books are about. And we now have this official field called positive psychology. And, you know, we've been speaking about positivity for many, many, many years. But why is this considered a relatively new field of like less than 20 years? Because of the new empirical research behind it. Right. Right. Because when that first kind of came on the floor 30, 40 years ago, it was little or no research. It, it it certainly was thought to be an interesting thing that some people do, but um, had no idea the value of it um, for people who practice it over time. Right, right. No, you no idea the value of it. Absolutely. So, so. Now we actually have all this research on, you know, measuring brain waves and alpha waves and everything about the benefits of meditation and mindfulness. So, right. so just tell us, Dr. Mark, and this is Dr. Duffy Spencer. We are just relationships, 90.3 WHPC. And I am interviewing Dr. Mark Beischel, who is the author of Calming the Brain Through Mindfulness and Christian Meditation. So, tell us where we start. We don't know anything. Tell us where we start. Well, to me, you start with, with, with uh, maybe even before birth, and certainly shortly the year after birth, when the brain is still developing uh, in infants, especially the frontal area of the brain. Um, and if you don't come in an environment where you can trust that if you need something, if you're hungry, if you're cold, if you need a hug, mm-hmm. that there's somebody, the minute you make a sound, will come and take care of that. Mm. But that's not the, the history of, of, of some families. That's right. In, in some families, what I've observed for many, many years now is that when they hear an infant cry, instead of uh, stimulating them to be nurturant, they end up feeling irritated. Mm. So in, instead of going and taking care of the diaper or the put the bottle in the, on the stove or whatever, they end up uh, just turning up the TV mm. um, or yelling at the kid and ultimately, I've seen many, many cases where they end up smacking the kid around when they're mm. crying. So oh. they, they get the message all backwards. We now biologically think it's about oxytocin, mm-hmm. uh, which is a chemical in the, in the brain that triggers nurturance. So if you hear an infant cry... If it, it ought to trigger oxytocin, and you want to get up and go take care of whatever it is. But if you hear it and it doesn't do that, then it's going to be irritating. And so I've you know I've watched this, and especially when I do, it, it, I used to do a lot of in-home work, mm-hmm. and you'd see an infant crying because they had a dirty diaper or whatever. And the parents wouldn't do anything. And I would say, aren't you going to do something? Mm-hmm. So what do you mean? And <laughs> uh, you know, I almost had to tell them what to do. Uh, there was a period when I worked with Head Start Mothers in Gary, Indiana. And this was really obvious with that group, that they really, it didn't trigger that system. Um, and so, uh, as a result, those infants weren't cared for the same way, and many of them ended up getting uh, traumatized mm. when they cried. And so, that certainly is the background out of the insecurity. 
you don't know whether you're cared for or not. You just you don't, don't know, know whether somebody, uh, if you cry, this is going to work. It's always interesting to me if you, when you test these kids, their language development is way lower than their performance development. Mm-hmm. And it probably is related to the fact that when you cry, it really didn't work. Huh? You didn't really get your needs met. Oh, I see. Because there wasn't a caring adult to do it. Wow. And so, um, at any rate... Um, so you said... If the, I'm sorry, Dr. Mark. If no, the no, la- go ahead. If the language development is slower than the task development, or, or what... Well, what, well what, performance, performance, kind of high hand. Right. Uh, if you watch these kids, they scurry around, they do really good stuff with their hands. Right. But... <clears throat> And if if you look at the speech they produce, right, it's very deprived, right. And so, when you do intellectual testing, that becomes obvious with these uh, many of these many of the children like this that I've seen over the years. So. Oh, I feel so sad hearing this. Oh, it, it, it's terribly sad. Yes, it is so sad, and that and that limits them for the rest of their lives because they. They cannot right. make themselves heard for the rest of their lives because they're... Well, they're and I, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we adopted three children about 40 years ago. Wow. Who were in, who were in their mid to late 40s now. And so I've watched them struggle with these issues over the many years. Um, and, it, and it's, uh, of course, it, it motivated us to really give them everything they needed when they were living with us. Dr. Uh, Mark, you said three? Three children? Yes, yes. You adopted, th- you and your wife adopted three children? Yes, we did. Wow. But you know, part of the adoption was understanding all of this. Yes, And yes. knowing that if we had the capacity, we had to do something. For the world, huh? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe it wouldn't be looked upon as something big and great. But for us at the time, that's where we were at. Uh, right. Well, and you and you adopted those children knowing full well that they would be um, developmentally challenged in their languaging and oh, that yeah. sort and, of thing. And, and, they, and, and they were terribly abused. They have little scars over their bodies. My son had cigarette burns uh, down his neck, his oh, back. Oh, dear. Uh, one of his birth brothers had it all the way to his heels, where they ground out cigarettes um, on mm. his back. So uh, they went through pretty terrible uh, tear in development. The opposite of what we think good parents ought to do, the, yes. which is take care of their needs. Right. Instead, oh they did the opposite, you know. And, you know, we like to think that there aren't many parents like that. Yeah. But my clinical experience is there's way more than anybody guesses. Yes, yes. There's more trauma going on in families than... I remember when I first got in the work, yeah. how, um, how shocked I was. And mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody lived like that, you know? Right. right. Everybody, it, you, you kind of always want to believe that everybody's yes. like your family. Right. But they're not. And I remember uh, going through my own little trap about having to deal with that now. Oh. And then when we got our children, of course, um, it, it really moves you to help them when you see that. Right, right. I don't. I don't see how anyone can really recover from that fully. I guess. Well, I'm not sure anybody a hundred percent does, uh, but some people recover quite a bit. It's kind of surprising. Um, of one of my three children, my one daughter was diagnosed with dyslexia as a um, as an infant, or is it uh, probably around kindergarten? 
mm-hmm. is now working on her doctorate. So she had.